and welcome to SignalPad. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the second part of the repair for the Azure N5230A two-port network analyzer. This is a 13 and a half gigahertz network analyzer. And in the previous video, we saw that the module that goes in here controls the final stage multiplication uh, for to reach 13 and a half gigahertz, as well as VGAs and attenuators and couplers and levelers and so on. And that module was defective. And further investigation revealed that Within the module, one of the solid state switches that switches the input between the doubled path and the uh, single forward path is damaged and broken. And that's why the, the whole thing doesn't work, especially in the upper range and the power is too low. So I said, well, what if we try and replace the component inside the module by itself? But the problem was that everything in that module is done with wire bonded dies on this uh, complete metallic substrate there. So it's going to become quite difficult to do this by hand. So I also thought maybe we can replace it with a packaged component. And there was a whole bunch of people asking me if I wanted in their help in, in order to replace it using a wire bonder because I don't have a wire bonder. And I really appreciate all of that. Sorry, I haven't gotten back to you. It's just I've uh, been really busy. But having said that, we still need the die and that's quite difficult to find. But I did find a replacement component, which was a solid state switch uh, from Hittite. And that component I actually tried to put in here. And this is a very little space here, only three millimeter th by three millimeter open gap where you could work there. And I tried to use micro coax to uh, jump the wires across and the voltages aren't fully compatible to switch it. So I had to modify the board and create my little voltage converter. So while I was doing this, it was getting quite difficult, very, very tough to get those wires attached. This, this thing has a huge thermal mass, so you have to use several epoxy and things are becoming very complicated. Thank you, Pooch. And Pooch, of course, is always helping. So now the question is, what do we do next? Well, as I was kind of investigating what the next step should be, and as I was trying to fiddle around with this and get these wires in there, I actually came across one of these modules on eBay from China for just over $1,000. Now that's pretty expensive, but it's the only one that was there. And thanks to your Patreon support, because of the support that you provide the website, I was able to purchase it so we can have a brand new, well, I should say a used module that hopefully still works. I haven't tested it to put back in here and fix the problem. And we can still have this and potentially replace the die and have a working backup one and maybe even sell it back on eBay or give it to somebody else who may have a similar problem. One of you guys might have one of these units that has a similar problem. So this can be up for uh, grabs of somebody who needs it. But having said that, we can go ahead and try and see what happens if you put the module back in there. I also want to show you my thought process behind choosing the component that I chose here, and we can take a look at some of those specification. And better yet, if this thing works, we can use the network analyzer to measure the switch which I have on a, a prototype, prototype carrying board there. So there's a lot of cool things we can still do. Let's start with putting this guy back in here, see if it actually works and the unit comes back uh, working normally again, and then we can do a whole bunch of interesting measurements. So here's a quick comparison between the, the new one that I got and the board of the old one. Interestingly enough, this one is revision 003, and this one is revision 005, so it must be a, a little bit newer. I can see some differences potentially, but nothing really major. The components are obviously different um, brand names being used and so on, but everything else is in exactly the same places and it looks uh, quite similar. So it should be compatible. I, I think they are the same part number, so I don't see any issues with that. It's better to use the later revision anyway. It's probably a bit of a younger unit. So having said that, it's pretty dirty. It's got you know dirt all over the connectors, must have been uh, inside some other instrument for a long time. I hope it actually works. It will be a pain to return this uh, in back to China if it doesn't work. So having said that, let's plug it back in. I'm gonna clean it and we'll turn the instrument on and see what happens. All right, and here's the unit now, everything closed back together and the module has been installed. And if you remember originally, the instrument couldn't go above zero dBm, no matter what frequency it was. And it certainly wasn't outputting anything more than minus 25 dBm above 10 and a half gigahertz. Now it would make sense that the power, even at lower frequencies, would be out of spec because the switch was in the path for the entire frequency range. It just happens that the switch had a much lower loss in the forward low frequency path, in the lower band of the range than in the upper band. So that kind of makes sense that why we were getting that result. So right now I have the instrument set back to CW mode, running at one gigahertz carrier and zero dBm Apple power. And I have it hooked up to my power sensor up there. And the power sensor is calibrated and set to one gigahertz right now. So the power we are reading is going to include the losses of these cables and connectors and the power meter is already calibrated. So let's take a look and see what we get. And as to expected, we're getting the power we want. We're getting uh, zero dBm. Now it's a little bit less than zero dBm. 
And the reason for that is because there's some losses in the cable. But now I can go much higher power, which is quite amazing because the incident power for the S parameter for passive lossy devices, you want to be as much as possible to improve the dynamic measurement, dynamic range of the measurement. So let's set the power. I can go up to 5 dBm. There it is. You can see it works. I can go to 10 dBm. And I can even get 10 dBm. Now I wonder if I can go any more than that before I get unlevel. There you go. So it seems like 11 dBm still works. Let's see. Can I do 15 dBm? I can even do 15 dBm at low frequencies. That's pretty amazing. So I'm quite happy with the fact that the switch is definitely working at least. The module seems to be working quite nicely. So right now it's set to 15 dBm and I'm getting 15.05. So that means that there is some nonlinearity in the AGC loop inside the instrument. Now you can calibrate that out most likely, but it doesn't typically matter that much as long as you're close enough for S parameter measurements. So let's set it back to 10 dBm, and now let's just change the frequency and see if we can get this at higher frequencies. So I'm going to set the frequency to 5 gigahertz. Here's 5 gigahertz, and you can see the power changes a little bit lower because there's more losses in the cable, and I'm not entering the calibration coefficient of the power sensor itself. It still thinks the signal is at 1 gigahertz, so the loss factor is not taken into account. But it's generating power at the frequencies we want. So that's really promising. Let's go to 10 gigahertz. 10 gigahertz. Very nice and stable. So now we go slowly up. We can go to 11 gigahertz. Now it used to do nothing at 11 gigahertz. And check it out. It works. It actually works. So the module is functional. And I can go to the maximum frequency of the instrument, which is 13 and a half gigahertz. There you go. At 13 and a half gigahertz, now the loss of the cables are really kicking in. But the instrument's not generating any errors. So if I come back over here and show you the instrument screen, you can see that we're not getting the unlevel symbol uh, on the screen here at all. Now, if I try and increase the power, after a certain point, I will get the unlevel. Uh, but if you have to find out exactly how much, let me see if I put it to, there you go. You, see, you can go over 10 dBm. We cannot do 10 dBm at 13 and a half gigahertz. But you know what? It really uh, doesn't matter. It works really well. It's much better than before. So now the only question is, does it also provide the same power on the other port? So we can go ahead and try that. See, I just hand tighten these. You got to be very, very cautious with these type of connectors because these are of course, metrology grade connectors, and uh, although this instrument is old, but still, we have to be as careful as possible. And here on the other port, you can see that it generates just a tiny bit less power than 10 dBm. You can see right now we're at 9.84 dBm, and it doesn't generate any error. And if I try to increase it just above that, uh, just above 10, and we're getting on level, but that's already above the spec, so we're perfectly fine. So it seems to be working very nicely. Now the question is, uh, what can we measure with it? But the best thing is to measure with it is what I had in mind to put into the original module. So let's let me go back and, and show you how I went through choosing this switch and what kind of switch it is and what kind of performance it has, and see if we can do an S parameter measurement on the switch itself and get some information, which would be a nice way to also verify the functionality of the unit too. And here is the switch that I had in mind to use. This is the HMC 547A. This is a Hittite part now. Once analog devices purchase Hittite, it's going to be within their portfolio, and that's why it's labeled analog devices. Now, this is a gas mimic, as to be expected. So we would get very good linearity and very low loss and reasonably good uh, isolation from this device, which is exactly what we get. So we have a high isolation, more than 50 dB of isolation, up to 5 gigahertz, and as more than 40 uh, up to 15 gigahertz. So it's going to be a good device to use in this kind of application. And in fact, one of its typical application is test instrumentation. These switches, you can find them in all kinds of devices. Uh, but as you can see, there are some uh, issues we have to solve if we wanted to put it into the module for this unit. Here's a little uh, functional diagram of it. Very, very straightforward. This is a very small package a QFN device. And this is what I exactly needed because the area I have to work with was so small. So the common input port RF here as an SPDT switch, one input RF. Uh, you can see this is a GSG, ground signal ground coplanar input. Again, that's to be expected. And we have two RF outputs, RF out two and RF one. And these two ports are back terminated into 50 ohms when they are not selected. So if there is any reflected power coming back, they will be dissipated in the on chip resistor giving you good isolation, further improving uh, the performance of anything you connect to it in case there's return signal so you don't get a whole bunch of mismatches when you switch off the, uh, the path. And then you have control A and B, which in a truth table tells you how these switches can be controlled. Now this is a gas device and uh, the control switch is negative and it has to go from minus, zero, minus 5 to 0 volts. In fact, you cannot put positive voltages on port A and B, it will destroy the device. 
So I had to make a modification and create that little circuit board I showed you, and that's just simply a diode preventing the voltage ever getting positive. So nothing really unusual there, and you can see that the size of the device is 3 by 3 millimeter, which is exactly the kind of space I actually had to work with. So it was pretty, pretty tight space. So now if you look at some of the other specifications here in the table, you can see various insertion losses, isolations, but the plots are quite nice to look at. So here you go, so the return loss from all three ports is you know, reasonable, up to 20 gigahertz, which is what is spec that is still below minus 10 dB, which is okay. Interesting to see that the uh, when the RF ports are off, of course, you're getting uh, the worst uh, linearity, uh, the worst uh, reflection there, which is also interesting, but of course because it has a 50 ohm termination, the low frequency uh, return loss is just going to be perfect, so that's not surprising. And the insertion loss starts from about minus one and a half and it just keeps going down, gets worse and worse. Again, to be expected from active devices, all the resistive capacitive components of the gas devices are eventually going to give you more and more attenuation, that's uh, to be expected. Now, if you look at here, we the isolation between the ports is better than 50 dB. They talk about that, and this is a gas device that has massive linearity. The input third order intercept point, you can see, is uh, goes as high as 50 dB in this, in this case. And this is at minus 40 degrees Celsius. Some strange cancellation must be going on here uh, with the temperature of the device being so low. I mean, this is crazy. But uh, the input compression is also very, very good. Uh, yeah, the uh, in P1dB at the input, yeah, massive. So you can use this very easily uh, at the output of uh, fairly low power PAs, and that's why they're used in SATCOM and telecom and radars and applications like that, and for test instrumentation where you want very, very high linearity from your devices not to affect your measurements, of course. So everything is really uh, not that surprising, and you can see here the uh, control voltage, uh, absolute maximum rating, 0.5 volts, can go over 0.5 volts, uh, maximum power you can dissipate into it. Thermal resistance, 118 degrees Celsius per watt, which is massive, and the thermal resistance, uh, with the, this is without the terminate, I believe, this, yeah, 200 degrees Celsius, which is huge. And this is not supposed to dissipate that much power. That's why it has, a, that's why it is like this. But it does have a plug at the bottom, and the slug at the bottom can be directly soldered onto a PCB for thermal relief, but it's also for grounding the RF and getting the, the model at, as accurately as possible. If you don't solder these grounds and you don't provide a good coplanar interface, then the numbers you're getting for insulation and return loss, they're not valid anymore, of course. So let's go ahead and, and uh, buy one of these, or uh, maybe buy maybe a handful, maybe five or six of them, so that we can uh, experiment with them and see what happens if we break them as we are using them. Here we go, and, well, I guess let's buy one of them, considering that it is $80 per chip. That's huge, this is not a very good price for this component, but I'm assuming that if you buy this in very large quantities, the price would be lower, even though here the price breakpoint is 10, but this must be a, either the, the life of this is coming to an end, or uh, somehow, this. I don't know why it's so expensive, that's crazy. So, let's get that, and it also has an evaluation board that we can take a look at and the evaluation board allows you to measure it directly on a little connectorized uh, device like that, which is great. So that would help us to do our S parameter measurement directly on it. So let's go ahead and get these devices and do some experiments. And here's the instrument after calibration. I just used a standard three and a half millimeter calibration kit for this purpose. And uh, I didn't load the files and the calibration coefficient. It's just a very rough calibration. I don't have an eCal which would be really good with this unit because you can then get all the calibration coefficient automatically. I have shown you in some of the other videos how to use an eCal to do network analysis calibration, in particular with the Roden Schwartz instruments that I did in the past. Now, this one is calibrated right now, and I've connected a through between the input and the output. Now, the scale here is really, really small. Uh, we're looking at a scale of only 0.01 dB per division. So you can see that the loss of the through, you know, it's just very, very little. We, we go as high as 0.04 dB. And you can see the variability of just moving this cable around. And of course, these are not phase stable cables, and the loss of it will also change as you change the shape of the cable a little bit. This goes to show the importance of having good phase stable cables to get a meaningful measurement from S parameters. Now we're doing a very rough measurement, so it's really not that big of a deal. But let's look at the module that I'm going to measure using the network analyzer. And here's the Hittite evaluation board, and you can see that we have the common port over here, and we have the two RF ports. Right now I'm terminating one of them, and I'm interested in the response from this port to this port when I switch from one side to the other, so we can see both the through response and the isolation as well as the return losses on both of the ports. You can see that this particular board over here even has a little through section where you can solder your own connector 
it's just crazy that they don't solder these connectors for you. You know, you're paying so much money for something like this. Just populate everything. And once you do that, then you're m able to measure the loss of the board itself and de-embed that loss uh, from your entire measurement. That's why they put this little piece over here. So you have a direct material comparison uh, between these two traces and it allows you to do an exact measurement and bring your measurement plane to the pins of the RFIC itself. So that kind of makes sense. So there's two resistors here that are used for the biasing there. So I'm just going to use a simple uh, clips to provide the bias to this. So let's hook it up to the next analyzer. So I'm going to use the Keithley source meter all the way in the back to provide the voltage to the switch. And I have connected the switch to the instrument like this. So we should be able to measure everything. Let me zoom into this screen here because you don't need to really see the whole instrument at the same time. And then I'll power it on and turn it on off and we can see the difference in the response. So with no voltage applied to the switch, of course you would expect very bad performance because neither of the switches are turned on, everything is reflecting. So if you look over here, the S11 is really, really bad. Uh, as you can see, we, we're starting from minus 2.6. So it has no termination because the switch, both of the switches are open. And S21 is you know, minus 25. You're just getting whatever isolation you have from the board and the device itself. So these two measurements right now really don't mean very much. And S22 is, of course, also bad. So let's go ahead and turn the switch on. And that way, we will reroute the signal to the port that we have. So I'm going to turn the switch on. And here's the response we're getting with RF port 1 is selected. Now the return loss has this uh, kind of this rising portion here that goes all the way to minus 14. I think it's supposed to be a little bit better than this. It's a little surprising, but anyway, so this is the response you can see. We have fairly matched now at the input all the way to 13 and a half gigahertz. And S21 is the loss, and you can see the loss is around minus 1.25. And it is above 2.5 up to 13.5 gigahertz, which is what you would expect. The noisiness of the measurement here is because of my poor calibration. And the scale here is pretty small, 0.5 dB per division. And of course, it matches perfectly with S21. It's a perfectly symmetrical device. And the S22, uh, you can see that has a response a little bit different than S11. But the board is different. You know, the, the angle which is coming is different. You have to de-embed the traces on the board. And the, the carrier board is going to influence the measurement. So we can't expect it to be exactly the same as a data sheet. But nonetheless, it also is fairly well matched. It, all the way at the end, it goes a little bit too high. But you can see the difference between S11 and S22 is quite significant. So now what we can do is we can go ahead and switch the order of the switch and, and turn, the, turn the path to the other side, which is right now terminated. And then what we will be measuring is the isolation of the switch. So let's give that a try. And here's the response on the when the channel is disabled. And check it out. I've already found the problem with this evaluation board. And can you spot it? I'll give you a moment to think about it. So remember what's actually happening right now. The input port, which is on port 1, is connected to the common port. And port 2 is the connected to the port which is now not connected to the common port. It's on the isolation part. So we expect a return loss on port 2 to be excellent because it's internally terminated in the switch as we saw in this functional diagram. So you can see very well matched. It's an on-chip 50 ohm resistor. So it's absorbing all the power from port 2 and it's fine. And the S21 has very good isolation, minus 55 dB at low frequencies. It goes to minus 40, which is exactly what the specification sheet says. And S12 and S21 are, are symmetric as to be expected. But check out S11. Now S11 is the return loss of the common port. Now, when the switch was connected to port 2, the return loss was very good. But why would the return loss be so bad at low frequencies and get better at high frequencies? This means that something is wrong with the evaluation board itself, that there's a flaw in the evaluation board. And by looking at this shape, you can tell exactly what it is. So let me bring it into camera. So here is the evaluation board. You can see the, the S11 path is measuring the path loss from here to here and then reflecting back. Now I have terminated this. If I remove this termination, you can see that I've gonna, I'm going to get very, very bad response. That's to be expected because this port is not terminated. But when I terminate this port, you would expect that it gets better across all frequencies, but it doesn't. Well, if it doesn't get very good response at DC, it means that the pin is not connected and we're just capacitively connected to the board. Let's verify that. We can go ahead and push on this pin. And if you make good contact, this should jump down. Let's give it a try. Here's a push on the pin. Check it out. I can fix it. This means that it has a cold solder joint. Look at that. I mean, this is just bad. For such an expensive part, 
it's already defective and I haven't done anything to it. I just opened it and connected right now. This is not because I put any torque or any pressure on it. This is just how it was shipped. So yes, indeed, there is a flaw with this part and it, that this pin is not connected. But you can see from the S11 response and you can diagnose exactly what's going on just looking at the shape of that file, or the shape of this curve over here. And then if I press down, I can fix it. So this should be a not too bad. can be fixed very easily uh, using the soldering iron, just putting a little heat on it to connect it. So there you go. I think this instrument is working, and you can already see an application of detecting a flaw by looking at the S-parameter measurement. This would be very difficult to, to detect with anything else other than a reflection measurement. So you could do a, potentially, you could do it with a spectrum analyzer and using interactional coupler. But of course, the network analyzer is the best tool for this purpose. And it's already working and quite happy. This is the highest frequency network analyzer that I have in the lab now. And we can do a whole bunch of other experiments in the future, but I cannot emphasize how grateful I am. It is because of your Patreon support that I could do A, buy the component that was broken, and also buy the components right now that we are testing. It is because of your support that this is possible. So and I have some really exciting things coming from my Patreon supporters. There's going to be some really awesome giveaways and uh, some really cool stuff in the future. So keep an eye out. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. But I assure you I'm going to help uh, my Patreon supporters in one way or another as time goes forward. So thank you again. If you like this video, let me know. I have a bunch of other things to record now. So I'm going to try and post this up. And I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.